The following presentation was recorded at the Aquaponics Association Conference in Tucson, Arizona on September 21, 2013. For more information or to join the Aquaponics Association, please visit the site at www.aquaponicsassociation.org. All right. Welcome everybody. I'm Rob Torsellini from Bigelow Brook Farm. Um, I own and operate this geodesic dome greenhouse. Um, I sort of call it the expensive hobby. It's not a commercial operation, but we produce uh, a whole bunch of uh, lettuce out of here and uh, tomatoes and a few other things. And uh, we consume it ourselves and also give it away to um, people at work. I'm also the uh, Director of Information Technology at Awaki America, um, and we manufacture uh, metering pumps, uh, process pumps, and uh, controllers. And I run the IT department there and really don't have a whole lot to do with the, uh, the pump industry with that, but uh, I can get pumps real cheap if I need to. Ironically, I don't use any of our Awaki pumps in my uh, greenhouse. <laughs> Um, mostly they're, they're really nice mag drive pumps, um, they're external pumps, but I, uh, I actually use submersible pumps in my system and they don't manufacture them. If they did, I would use them. Uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, running a system off grid. And um, there I am on the roof of the, uh, the greenhouse standing uh, next to one of my uh, one kilowatt panels. The other one on the other side is also one kilowatt and uh, this year I ac actually added a third uh, kilowatt to the system. So you're probably thinking to yourself, why on, worth, why on earth do you need so much power to uh, run a system? Well, we're located in Connecticut, um, New England, way out in nowhere land, uh, far from here, and we're definitely not like uh, in Arizona where we have plenty of sunshine. Uh, so a system like this would be probably more than enough to run a house uh, out here, um, but out uh, where we are, this is uh, barely enough uh, during the winter months to run a continuous 110 watts uh, for the pumps that are in this greenhouse. Uh, so I'm going to go over um, the various components for a system like this um, and just sort of detail each part of the module. Um, and then I have a spreadsheet that I use to calculate how to size a system and um, that spreadsheet could be used uh, anywhere. Um, and it's pretty funny because if you, if you do the calculations for here in Arizona, you can get away with a much uh, smaller system. And uh, again, this system's not like the little 45 watt ones that you can uh, buy from Harbor Freight. It's a little all-inclusive thing. You can usually get them for $150. Uh, those are really cool if you want to run your light in a shed for about 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, but I've, I've had people, you know, contact me, say, oh, I want to get this Harbor Freight system because it's on sale and, you know, can I run my aquaponics system with it? Yeah, you can during the day and, you know, 20 minutes after sunset, you're going to be out of luck, you know, running off of your car battery or something. So this is a real system. And uh, before we get started, quick safety lesson uh, with running these kinds of uh, uh, voltages and amperages. Um, I have a, a two, 24 volt uh, system and while it's charging it's usually running at about 90 amps and the difference between uh, AC electrical current that you have in your house, it's a nice sine wave and DC which is you know a standard direct current. Um, if you grab onto an AC current line you get that nice buzzing feeling and you're like Ugh, and you let go of it. Um, because of the alternating current um, when you grab onto it, your muscles uh, contract and relax um, with that kind of current. So it makes it easy to let go of a line like that. But with direct current, when you grab that line, it contracts your muscles and you can't let go and it kills you. So um, if you do uh, happen to go into uh, wanting to install a large system, if you really aren't comfortable working with DC currents, hire an electrician. Um, I know electrical work. I was trained in electronic engineering uh, years ago. And even with me working on this thing, I was nervous the whole time. It's just, it's a scary thing. Um, so there's your, your warning about that and uh, my liability release, let's put it that way. Um, it's 20, mine's running at 24 volts. There's a lot more power coming off the panels, but the system's classified as a 24 volt system because that's how the batteries are configured. It's just a mild buzz, it wouldn't bother you. I mean, DC will kill you very easily. Um, so this is just a quick uh, outline of the uh, components and 
Um, the next few slides, you'll just see arrows going to each one. And uh, this is a diagram uh, or a, a photo that I took of the system as I was installing it. So to get started, we have the uh, photovoltaic cells. And um, I have it set up where there's two independent uh, systems. And they're eventually tied together at the batteries. And um, each of these panels, they are classified as um, either 245 or 250 watt panels, each one. Uh, when I bought the first batch, they were actually 245, and then when I bought the third set of panels, they were 250s. So I'm technically just shy of a, a three kilowatt system. So what happens with the panels is that they are either um, tied together in parallel or series to get you up to a particular voltage that you need to get to um, your con um, charge controllers. And so here I have um, showing um, 12 panels uh, total in here, even though on the roof of the building it looks like there's three uh, individual sets that are tied together uh, uniquely to get me um, three in series in parallel with another two, and then there's another batch of them. And uh, that gets the voltage up high enough and the amperage enough to meet the uh, specific specifications of the, uh, the charge controllers. So a lot of it depends on uh, what equipment's available, the type of power that it can handle, and what you can pump through it without overcharging it or overloading the controllers. In fact, last winter I had just four panels in series. And during the winter months when it's cold out, um, cold our way is 15 degrees. It's not cold 90 degrees here. Um, <laughs> the, um, the panels run more efficiently the colder that they are. And so I was getting between the four panels um, over 150 volts and my charge uh, controls would actually shut down. So ironically during the winter when I needed the most power on a nice sunny day, the system was shutting down because I was getting an over voltage. And that's why now there's uh, three in series, which keeps me under the 150 volt range that the charge controllers can do. And then I double it up in parallel with another bank. So I still stay below the 150, but I pump more amperage through. So. Is that why you use two charge controllers? Yes. Um, because the two charge controllers are cheaper than buying one of the really big fancy ones. <laughs> So there's, you know, there's some economics involved with uh, trying to do that. And then uh, one of the nice things about having two charge controllers is that if one of them fails, you can still continue using your system, at least you know, partially crippled, without having to wait a week to get it replaced or buy a new one. You know. So um, it's always nice. You know, we love redundancy. You know, that's part of the whole thing with being off-grid, is you don't have to rely on um, the power company's uh, power. You know, we'll have a hurricane or something. We're in uh, rural Connecticut, and um, last year um, we were without power uh, for, um, I think, two different weeks. So we were about 10 to 12 days without power. Um, um, we'll get to that in a second. That's OK. <laughs> I'm going to hit each uh, topic, each uh, little part of this. So, um, For the lifespan of the photovoltaic, they usually say about 20 years is the warranty on these. Um, my brother, he works at the uh, National Renewable Energy Labs. Um, so he's a, um, an expert in the industry. And he says they have panels there that are 35 years old, and they're still running at the same efficiency as when they originally purchased it. Yeah, they, they run really, really well. Um, so that part, you know, that was a one-time investment, and hopefully I don't ever have to replace the panels unless they get struck by lightning or something. So we have all this power coming off the panels, and um, they run through it's essentially a circuit breaker or a disconnect box. And the main reason for this is that way, if you need to work on any of the equipment, you can turn off the sun. You want to be able to disconnect the equipment from your system and just trip a circuit breaker and disconnect it. So it's just a big switch. Um, and then I'll, I'll cover it later on, but then there's another set of switches on the, uh, off of the batteries so that you can disconnect the sun and your power that you have stored and work on the charge controllers if you need to. You didn't run a, a combiner box where you could also shut them off at the panels? Um, no, you can unplug the panels. They're, they just have a, um, like a quick connect on them. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, there's, there's a combiner box up on the roof, too. Um, there's no disconnect on it. You know you didn't put breakers in there as well? No. Okay. 
technically you're supposed to, but I didn't. Um, again, one of the rules, a safety rule with running with electricity is, um, and it was one of the first things I learned when I was in school when you're working with electricity, put one hand in your pocket and use your other hand because if you grab onto two things, right through your heart and you're dead. Um, so, you know, working with something, you know, you, you work with one hand. It's, and it, you remember that the whole time you're working with uh, high voltage electricity, or high current really is what kills you is the current. Um, it doesn't take much to, to do you in. You know, look how much, you know, you have a pacemaker or something, they're very little power and it keeps your heart doing different things. Uh, so next, um, we have, um, I chose the Midnight Solar uh, charge controllers, um, mainly combing through the forums and this is a very popular controller and it has very good reviews. In fact, about a month into uh, running the system, one of my controllers did fail and I contacted uh, Midnight Solar and they, no questions asked, I sent them the controller, they sent me a new one and we're up and running again. Um, it has a lot of really cool features built into this. I could probably go on the entire thing about all the options that this uh, controller has in it. Um, probably the nicest feature about this controller and with running them uh, in parallel and having two controllers, the controllers can be tied together. They, they have a nice communications network between them. So that way, um, if you're getting um, a charge on your controllers, there's different charging states with uh, the batteries. You have you know, a standard bulk charge and in the morning it just tries to pump in as much power into your batteries as it can. Uh, during the day it goes into an absorb mode which is you know, slightly less power going into your batteries, it's sort of topping it off. And then you have a float mode where the, um, bat the voltage going into your batteries is just sort of floating just enough to keep them topped off but you, you don't want to overcurrent your batteries. Um, so these two controllers actually talk to each other. So you don't get one controller thinking it should be floating and the other one thinking it should be absorbing and being at a differential with its voltage. Um, so they, are, they both communicate with each other. It has networking features in it. It has um, um, you know, all the display information tells you how many uh, amp hours that are going into the batteries, the wattage, the voltage, uh, all kinds of really cool things. Um, those controllers, I think they're about $800 a piece, um, so um, they aren't cheap. Um, next is the disconnect box, so that way it disconnects your batteries, um, the load controllers uh, from your batteries. Again, it's uh, strictly uh, really a safety feature. And that way, if you had a, a charge controller that failed, you can flip the breakers um, from the panels and from the batteries and safely remove the equipment uh, from the system. And um, I think these are 100 amp breakers, um, so it'd be, you'd be really hard pressed to um, get one of those breakers to trip. You, you basically would have to direct short out the line and um, get the breaker to trip. Yes. You cannot use AC breakers. Um, they act differently than a DC breaker. So yeah, you can't just go to Home Depot and buy one of these breakers. And these breakers aren't cheap. If you uh, do break one of them, I had one of them when I was uh, wiring the terminal on the back. Snapped the terminal off because I over torqued it, and I had to uh, purchase another one. So. Um, and I worked with one company for this whole setup. It was, uh, the company is called Silicon Solar um, out of uh, New York State. And basically you sort of work with them to uh, get all the right pieces together and the, the, the stuff just shows up on a truck and they're assuming you know what you're doing putting it together. You know, they basically sell to, you know, electrical installers and whatnot, but they're very good uh, working with me. Rob, what did you say the charge controller was rated at? Um, 150 volts, and I've seen it, I think it's 85 or 90 amps. Um, the most I've ever seen coming through it is uh, 45, uh, around 48 um, out of my system. So you could have done all that on one charge controller? It would have been really close, yeah, yeah. very close. Um, also this um, one uh, a box has one additional circuit breaker on it and that's the um, line that comes off the batteries and then goes to the load. Um, the load is a technical term for all your stuff that you're running on it. Um, so the load is um, your pumps or any other electronics um, that you would have. 
So these are the batteries. Um, I think they are rated for 410 amp hours. And um, these are six volt batteries. They stand about this high. I mean, they weigh about 200 pounds, 210 pounds a piece. So you can see there's, there's handles on the side of them. So you can pick it up and sort of scoot them over or use a hand truck if you really need to. And these are uh, standard lead acid uh, deep cycle batteries. I know a lot of people that have um, systems, they'll usually use like a marine deep cycle golf cart batteries, uh, forklift batteries, you know, all, anything that can handle a deep cycle. And um, the deep cycle is sort of a, a weird terminology because People think I can charge up my battery, run my system, and drain that battery down to nothing, and then recharge it again. That's not true at all. You, well, it is true, but your battery's not gonna last very long at all. Um, so the specifications, these are made uh, by Trojan. Their specification is um, a 50% uh, depth of discharge. So that's an, an average of how deep or how low a battery should get uh, before it should really be uh, recharged. Um, otherwise, you can start damaging your batteries. Yes, sir. There are eight batteries here. So there's six volt batteries. Um, there are four put in series, which gets you up to 24 volts, and then another four in series, and then those are put in parallel uh, with the other uh, set. They're very tall. They're about knee height. Big, big batteries. And um, based off the calculations, um, this system, if we had uh, really, really poor sunlight, um, we can get about three days off of this. And if you're in a sunny location like here, I think, what is it, 350 days of perfect sunlight, something like that. It's, it's insane, you know, we're coming in here and you see these huge solar systems all over the place and you're like, oh, that's pretty nice. Um, but in Connecticut, um, we can go for a week easily without even seeing the sun. Um, so during the day, um, with all the panels that I have up on the roof on a cloudy day, it basically is enough to barely sustain the system at, during the day, and then I have to rely on the batteries uh, to keep the system running uh, during the night. So depending on where you're on the country, you sort of have to figure out, well, how many, you know, worst case scenario, how many days of uh, cloudy days are we gonna have? Because if you're running off grid, you run out of power, what are you gonna do? Get a generator or start running extension cords from your house to, to get the system going. And last winter, I had an extension cord running down from our house just to, to top off the system. Um, you know, I had to switch everything off, run everything on AC pumps instead and you know it becomes a nuisance so it looks like overkill um, but it's sort of necessary if you if you totally want to be uh, truly running off grid you know if you're in a house you may run out of battery power you're like oh who cares i'll go to bed early tonight and it doesn't matter but you run out of power the next morning your fish are just be floating at the top of the tank because you have no aeration uh, in your system so you know you could have a very large investment of uh, fish or plants, it's usually the fish that are gonna die first in your system. Um, you know, if you had $1,000, $2,000 of the fish, you don't wanna lose that. I've done it, I know from first hand, I've lost all my koi before, and go and order another few hundred dollars of the fish, that would have been, you know, another battery. Actually, I had to buy four at a time, so another couple thousand dollars in batteries is uh, each uh, uh, set of those. So there's a trade-off, you have to decide if you wanna you know, have a good backup system uh, for your aquaponics system or, you know, choose something else, a grid tie or whatnot. We'll, we'll discuss that in, a, in another couple of minutes about grid tie. <laughs>